right. Well, uh, good morning and uh, thank you to uh, all the medical students who are here with us uh, today. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, along with my uh, virtual global spine conference colleagues uh, in collaboration with the brain and spine group to uh, uh, give this presentation and uh, really give everybody uh, an overview of spine surgery. Uh, and then later on, uh, my colleagues will go a little bit deeper into uh, some of the different pathologies. I'd like to thank the uh, Brain and Spine Group for putting this together, as well as putting together all of the other excellent neurosurgical training modules for medical students. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and begin. I'm going to uh, give uh, uh, all of you an introduction into spine surgery. What is it? How can you become a spine surgeon? And uh, what to expect? Uh, my name is Ali Baj. I'm uh, an associate professor uh, of neurosurgery and orthopedics, uh, recently moved here to the University of Arizona in Phoenix. So thank you for joining us and we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. So um, well, first of all, uh, what is uh, spine surgery? So spine surgery is not a specialty per se, but it's more of a subspecialty uh, that deals with the treatment of, uh, uh, the surgical treatment of spinal cord, spinal nerve, spinal column uh, pathologies. Uh, these include, not limited to, but they include uh, trauma and fractures, tumors, infection, degenerative disease, which is really the most common type of uh, disease pathology that we deal with. Uh, also scoliosis, adult and pediatric scoliosis. So that's really an overview of what spine surgery is, but how do you become a spine surgeon? A lot of medical students here with us today, what do you need to do uh, to become a spine surgeon? Well. Um, as it stands now, you either have to complete a neurosurgical residency or an orthopedic residency. And there are pros and cons to both, and it just depends on what you like, what else you want to do, and what career path uh, you want to take. Uh, many of you already know this, but uh, residency, neurosurgical residency, is uh, seven years in the United States. Um, it is important to know that a spine surgery training or spine training in most programs is really anywhere between 40 to 60% uh, of training. So I did a neurosurgery uh, residency and I can tell you that more than 50% of it was spent doing spinal operations. And that's just the nature of, of our field. Most neurosurgeons do not uh, uh, do fellowships after uh, their training. They're very well equipped uh, with uh, doing uh, what we call bread and butter spine surgery or community spine uh, uh, surgery. So most will not need to do a fellowship. Uh, who, who goes on to, to doing fellowships? Um, I can tell you that uh, my colleagues here, uh, uh, my, my faculty colleagues that are going to be following me, um, the neurosurgeons, they've all done uh, spine fellowships. And that's because we either want an advanced training in one particular aspect of spine surgery, like pediatric spine, advanced deformity, minimally invasive spine, or, um, we want to uh, really make an impact in research, teaching, and academics. Those are probably the, the scenarios in which a neurosurgical uh, resident uh, completes training and wants to do a spine fellowship, but it is absolutely not necessary. Residency in neurosurgery is seven years. It's already long enough, and uh, many are very, very well equipped to uh, performing uh, community-based uh, neurosurgical procedures after training. Um, if you go the orthopedic surgery route, uh, orthopedic residency is five years, um, but many will need to do a spine uh, a fellowship after the residency. And that's just because of the way uh, the, surgical, the, uh, the residency programs are, are, uh, are structured. So in most orthopedic residencies, there is anywhere between three months to a year, maybe a little bit more that is uh, committed to spine surgery or on the spine service, but it typically is not adequate to uh, uh, really feel confident with, with the vast majority of spine surgical procedures. So many of our colleagues in, in, in orthopedics have gone on to performing uh, and completing spine fellowships after orthopedics. Uh, the good news is orthopedic surgery is five years. So if you add one year, which most, if not all spine fellowships are, that's six years. So it just depends on which route you want to take. Now be mindful, if you enjoy the spine, if you enjoy the spinal column, the nervous system, there are other specialists that do perform uh, spine procedures. Um, 
Dr. Wendy Gibbs, who's a neuroradiologist with us uh, today, who will also be giving a talk. She's an interventionalist. She does spine procedures. Uh, I have colleague in, uh, colleagues in anesthesia and pain management, PMNR, who do spine procedures like injections, blocks, spinal cord stimulators, uh, peripheral nerve stimulators. So um, while they're not doing spine surgery per se, they can do spine procedures and they do it very well. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, but here we're going to focus on the traditional open spine uh, surgical uh, procedures. So that's how you become a spine surgeon if that's what you want to do. And I encourage everyone here, all the medical students to uh, seriously consider it because it is a phenomenal subspecialty and it's a great, great field. Now, I'm going to give a very general outline of some of the pathologies that we deal with. And again, my colleagues here will, uh, to follow me, will go into detail uh, into certain pathologies. But the most common things we see as spine surgeons are what's called the degenerative spine pathologies, cervical stenosis, lumbar stenosis, uh, lumbar disc herniations. And if you've rotated uh, on uh, neurosurgical uh, services or you've, um, or you've spent some time with either an orthopedic spine surgeon or a neurosurgeon, you have definitely seen this. This is the bread and butter of what we do. And if you have scrubbed in into cases like cervical laminectomies, ACDFs for aminotomies, that's for the neck, for the lower back or for the lumbar spine, it's laminectomies, laminectomies, infusions, microdiscectomies. Those are really constitute 80% plus of what most spine surgeons do. Um, this is an image uh, of lumbar disc herniation. Uh, again, you've, you've seen this, you've probably scrubbed into those cases. Uh, there are now some really exciting techniques like uh, and, and endoscopy um, and other ways of doing these surgeries in a much more minimally invasive fashion. So the, uh, the degenerative disease, cervical, lumbar, that's going to be the vast majority of, of pathologies that spine surgeons deal with. Um, if we go a little bit into detail, some of the stuff that, uh, uh, so some of the pathologies that some of us enjoy uh, here, uh, uh, that's a little bit more than your bread and butter cases. Uh, several of us here on the, on the webinar today actually enjoy spinal deformity surgery. These include scoliosis, kyphosis, or any mixed, uh, or any mixed uh, uh, form of that. And we also enjoy doing a lot of spondylolisthesis surgery, which is a slippage or a malalignment uh, of the spine. Uh, this is an example of one of my patients who had severe degenerative lumbar scoliosis and kyphosis, and she needed a big surgery, um, what we call T8, uh, T9 or T10 to pelvis, rather big operations. Uh, but these are deformity surgeries where we're decompressing the spinal canal with a laminectomy, but we're also uh, realigning, correcting the curvature. These are what we refer to when we talk about, degen when we talk about deformity or scoliosis surgery. Um, we also do a lot of spondylolisthesis surgery. All spine surgeons uh, uh, should know how to do this. This is usually at either the L4-5 or the L5-S1 level. This is a particular type of listhesis called a uh, ismic high-grade spondylolisthesis. Um, but we also, that's typically in adults and children. But in children, we also, uh, some of us see adolescent scoliosis. These are teenagers with uh, significant curvatures of the thoracic and lumbar spine. Um, and, and it's important for me to say this now to, to, to some of our audience and the medical student participants. Um, it, traditionally, neurosurgeons have done a lot of microdiscectomies, tumors, minimally invasive spine, and orthopedic spine surgeons do the scoliosis, the pediatric scoliosis. And, and what a lot of you probably have seen already and will continue to see over the next 10 to 15 years, so just when you're about to be completing training and starting practice, is there's a slow overlap of some of these pathologies. So you have some neurosurgeons who do adult and pediatric scoliosis, um, and you have some orthopedic spine surgeons who are very good at minimally invasive surgeries or tumors. So now there is a lot of uh, overlap. Um, so I just wanna make sure you're aware of that. So again, we see adult scoliosis, some of us see pediatric or adolescent scoliosis, and this is, uh, these are some x-rays. Um, we, we don't have to go into the details of this now, but, but just so that you're aware of the different pathologies uh, that we see. These tend to be bigger operations with multiple screws and rods and, and uh, correction maneuvers to straighten out uh, the spine, whether in adults or, or in children. So these are deformity uh, surgeries. 
Um, now, deformities can also happen due or can also occur as a result of infections, like this young child who uh, was uh, who had a, a tuberculous uh, a deformity or tuberculous spondylitis uh, type of deformity that needed uh, a, a focal but high risk uh, procedure. So uh, realize that the techniques and the tools that you learn as a spine surgeon, you can apply in different uh, uh, scenarios. As a spine surgeon, again, whether you're going down the neurosurgery track or the orthopedic spine surgery track, you will see a lot of spine trauma. Spine trauma is very common, especially in young males, uh, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents, uh, falls off ladders, things like that. Um, but there's a lot of uh, trauma that uh, you need to be comfortable with uh, as a spine surgeon. This is a very, very common type of fracture, for example, in this case called a burst fracture that needs decompression and stabilization with cages, screws, rods. This is another example. This was an L5 fracture dislocation that was uh, uh, handled with both anterior and posterior approaches. So I'm trying to give you an idea that the that the spine surgery is very diverse. There are a lot of different techniques and tools uh, that we use. Uh, we see a lot of infections. A spine surgeon will have to see infections and these are either a result of previous surgery or they're de novo. They had, you know, a patient may have never had surgery before, but had bacteremia or sepsis or a urinary tract infection or a skin infection that seeded the spinal column and, uh, and the patient developed a spinal infection. So infections is, 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 part, is part of what we do and see as, as a spine surgeon. And of course, some of our favorite topics here, especially if you talk to neurosurgeons, uh, spine tumors. And I know you're going to have an excellent uh, couple of sessions on spine tumors later uh, this morning, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But we deal with spinal tumor, tumors that are in the spinal column or uh, within the spinal column, like uh, around the dura, around the spinal cord, and I will show you some cases. So this is a malignant nerve sheath tumor. Uh, this is from a, from a nerve sheath that becomes uh, basically malignant and large and invades the, the spinal canal. This is what it looks like uh, before, uh, before it was taken out. As a neurosurgeon, uh, we do uh, spinal cord tumors. Remember, there are tumors that are within the spinal cord and there are ones that are outside of the spinal cord. These tumors like astrocytomas or ependymomas like this one, these are within the spinal cord and they're very, um, uh, they're high risk surgeries, but they're very rewarding for patients. They tend to be benign and patients tend to do well with these. Uh, so this is a skill set that really uh, uh, is, is very valuable to gain during neurosurgical training to know how to do these microsurgical skills, so uh, to microsurgical procedures, so you're able to perform these operations uh, safely. So this is another ependymoma. We call this a mixopapillary ependymoma. Again, these are intradural tumors. And if you do neurosurgical training, you will see these and you will learn how to uh, remove these tumors. Very satisfying operations. And my colleagues, Dr. Gibbs, Dr. Shin, will go uh, into detail about different types of spine tumors in the next, uh, in the next few sessions. Now, if you wanna learn more about spine surgery, of course, I recommend a very good book uh, that uh, actually a few colleagues and myself put together called The Handbook of Spine Surgery um, that has several uh, uh, very good information. Let me put it this way, on both pathology and techniques. Uh, and, uh, but of course, in addition to that, uh, there is the, the Greenberg uh, Handbook of Neurosurgery is an excellent resource for medical students, I, I, I believe. And uh, uh, there are also uh, resources on our uh, organizations like the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, CNS, the AANS. Here I put some, um, uh, some uh, uh, Twitter uh, handles here for some stuff on Twitter if you're active on that. Of course, I have to more promote Virtual Spine because that is uh, my colleagues are there and myself and we put together weekly sessions for both surgeons and trainees and students. So I, uh, uh, I really urge you to join us. I know many of you have already on our weekly sessions, which is phenomenal to see, but there's really a plethora of information out there on spine surgery, how to become a spine surgeon, what are the things that you need to see and do, but really it all starts first with making a decision whether you want to commit to a neurosurgery training program or orthopedic surgery program. Uh, a training program. And from both of those uh, venues, you can then go on to subspecialize in spine. I wanna thank you for uh, joining uh, me today. 
and uh, I really uh, hope that uh, you enjoy the rest of this uh, the morning. Uh, the Brain and Spine Group and the uh, Virtual Global Spine Conference faculty have put together a great program for the medical students and never hesitate to reach out if you have uh, questions or you want to learn more about this uh, terrific field. All right. Well, thank you very much and enjoy uh, the rest of your morning, folks. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.